probably one of the greatest cases in point was Sam Burgess, you know, where I feel like they wrecked the poor fella's head, you know what I mean? Because they had him playing one position in one yeah. team, another position in another team. That guy could have been an absolute weapon, right? Hello and welcome to the Rugby Pass Offload with Max Leif and Ryan Wilson. Later on the show, we'll be joined uh, well, by a true uh, rugby legend, a national coach across both formats, currently in the country uh, for the Rugby League World Cup, the one and only Michael Checker. But first, Ryan, you are over in South Africa, apart from that disappointing scoreline against the Sharks. Uh, does it look like you're having a pretty good time out there? Well, does it? Does it? Because I can't swim in the sea. Because apparently someone's shit in there. Literally, there was a flood in April. All the rivers swelled up, and then all the shit went into the sea, and no one can swim in there in case you get E. coli. So, can't go in the sea. Um, out on a bit of dinner the other night, some fella comes over to me. Hey, my bro, great, massive fan of the pod, massive fan of the pod. I love you guys. I love Nick Leaf. Oh, what a legend, man! Like, hey, all right, mate. Yeah, nice to meet you. I'm trying to yeah, eat me dinner. And he's like, no, 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 please, can we get a bit? Yeah, you have a fight, mate. And he's steaming. He's absolutely steaming. And he's going, you must mention me on the podcast, mate. You've got to. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, mate, yeah. No, no, no. He should speak to my friend. He gives me his phone. I'm like, right. Hello? No one there, mate. Your phone's not working. No, oh, no, sorry, man. Okay, no worries. Anyway, off he goes. 45 minutes later, I leave this restaurant. As I'm walking down the hill towards the pub, not going to the pub, just walking down the hill towards the pub, he's stumbling down the hill like yellow stuff all over him, pissing like tears from his eyes. Stop. I'm like, you're right, fella. No, man. Puss, man. I've been pepper sprayed. <laughs> someone, someone obviously got pissed off of him and pepper sprayed him, mate. He's snotting, snotting in his face. Bright red eyes, like yellow all over his teeth. Like, push, man. Someone bloody pepper sprayed me, my man. Oh, so had a bit of that as well. And then on top of that, Everyone's had the shits and the vongs. Like, it's gone through the squad like you wouldn't believe. 15 blokes shitting and vomiting everywhere. It's uh, It's been horrendous. And then add to that, after the game, four head knocks, one broken jaw, one torn calf, 16 people shitting through the eye of a needle. And I'm pretty sure my roommate, Lucio Sordini, is uh, he's been taken over by the exorcist. The way he snores at night. I've never known anything like it was. It's, it's fucking incredible. It's... It's madness. So you, you think I'm having a lovely time. It's been tough. It's been bloody tough. Yeah. So, yeah, stepped in at number eight. It's quite nice, actually. I haven't played eight. Oh, actually. Nice, it's quite nice, actually. And, uh, yeah, a little 80 minutes under the belt in uh, in Durban at Kings Park, which, by the way, Max, have you ever played at Kings Park? No, I haven't. Very, very cool stadium. Wait, wait, is Kings Park the Shark Tank? Yeah, the shark. Tank. I've seen. I've been inside. I've not actually played. In it. Yeah, it's amazing how steep it is, isn't it? Yeah, but they've got they've got like flumes with slides into a little swimming pool. Like kids are like going swimming at one end behind oh. the pipe. So there's two flumes coming down into a swimming pool. There's bars all along behind the post, and it's like different little bars. And people are just sat out on like pub benches, like having a at the pub. It's absolutely oh, amazing. Yeah. Honestly, it's so cool. What an amazing stadium. And what's even more scary is, I couldn't remember playing there, but I played against Samaria before. And uh, someone had to remind me that. That's how bad my brain is. Anyway, yeah, cool place. Very cool place. Um, speaking of scary, what was it like facing the mythical beast that is Eben Etzebet? Did you, did you try and wind him up? Oh, I gave him a few. I was nabbing off a little bit. Um, did you? Calling some horrible stuff, yeah. I banged him once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He, he was on fire. It was his first game since signing as well. So you can imagine how fired up. The bloke was everywhere, boys. The bloke was absolutely everywhere. Kick chases, like, he's just so tall. He was just, he was on the kick chase, just like a, like a volleyball player, just tapping the ball back, mountain boys, putting ribs where they shouldn't be, line out. Yeah, he's, uh, he's pretty handy. He's pretty handy. Um, but I dealt with him when he come near me. He had to stay away from me, didn't he? These old shoulders. These old shoulders. Old, the old proud shoulders. Just close your eyes and dive at his knees. Hope for the best. Eddie Jones just named his autumn international squad. Some big omissions. No Henry Slade. No Elliot Daly. Uh, no room for last year's Prem Player of the Year, Ben Earl. I mean, what, what, what do we make of those boys? 
So no daily, no um, bet, Ben. Oh, that's big, lads. No Slade either. No Slade. Well, even more, can I just add, because he's a, he's a good friend of our show, the old pod buddy, Ollie Lawrence. I don't know if you saw him at the weekend. Yeah, 254 metres made against Saracens. 28 metres per carry. Two try assists. He beat 11 defenders. That's apparently the second most by a centre in, in Prem history since like Opta stats were first introduced. And somehow he's not in that squad. I mean, what the fuck? Yeah, maybe he wants a bit more from him, though. Like what? Does he need to, to, to fucking like juggle a or cure cancer? Of, probably like a series of good games. You know what Ed Joe's like. But Ben Earl's a funny, funky one. But the thing is, there's an embarrassment of riches for sevens. But I think Ben Earl offers something a bit different to the other boys. But wow. Yeah. And, Daly, and Daly's playing very well. Daly's playing very well. He's one of the form backs, I reckon, for Saris at the moment. So, oh, I don't know. The mad genius continues to tinker. He's got yeah, un- in the middle. He's got un- un- uncapped Caden Murley from Quince. Yeah, he's class. He's at, I've been I've been preaching about him cool, on the pod the whole time. He should have been in there ages ago. Blokes a freak show. Even when Quince are getting bummed, he does something class. Do you know what I mean? He score. He always scores. Blokes, blokes. Yeah, he's sensational. Get him in there, ASAP. Triple threat can do it all. He can run over guys. Got a bit of feet. Fast, clever, yeah, you go good. Michael, how are things going? Yeah, I'm okay, thanks. I'm all right. First up, you, you're allowed to put up an incredible fight on uh, on Sunday against New Zealand. Uh, run us through, firstly, your emotions when you guys went ahead at the start. Uh, yeah, we got a, like we set up some good play actually, and we got ourselves in a good position early, and we, we got the ball back off the kickoff. And then we got a bit of a lucky break and we were able to get, we're in the right area, you know, to, to, to get a score. Look, I think in general, we, we prepared pretty well. Like I've got some good coaching talent with me. Boys are pretty well prepared around what's important for us. So it didn't surprise me that we were right in the, in the tussle for, for long periods of time at different stages. I think obviously New Zealand have always going to have a little bit too much power for us in that regard. But I think around some of the fundamentals of the game, I always knew we'd be in the battle there. So I was good that it, it happened. I think going a man down didn't help us in the last 20 minutes. But, uh, you know, um, I was really happy with the lads. I'm not, obviously, we, we went out there to win the game, but it sets us up well. Uh, we start to build a bit of a house, you know what I mean? There's some foundations for the rest of the tournament. You're in a unique position where you coach see a, a national rugby side in both union and league. What, what have you found to be the biggest differences between the players in, in both sports from a sort of athletic and, and physical point of view? Obviously it's very, it's a very different game physically. You know, you've got um, a totally different concept. The effort, the effort still, you know, it's similar, but you've got different types of effort. You know, you've got 60 plus minutes of ball in play time going in an NRL or in a rugby league game as opposed to th- sometimes sub-30 in a, in a rugby game. You've got set pieces in a rugby game and the tussle of mauls and scrums and jumping and line-outs and all that type of thing. You don't have any of that in, in league. But we can, transitions in both games are extremely important. We have more every, nearly every play is a transition in rugby. But the league transitions are extremely important as well because they set out where, you, where you're starting your sets from. So you know, that which has a huge bearing on on where you finish at last play and last plays are really important in, in league. And then obviously in rugby, every ball is a contest. In, in league, most of the, the most of your plays are more strategic or you're setting up for something. And the contest is, okay, one-on-one strip or uh, um, high kick or kick at the end, kick ground, kick on the ground at the end of the game, at the end of the set. It's where it's possible. So there is... So, Many similarities, though. You know, ruck speed is key uh, in both codes. Um, the contact of the tackle and how that tackle cycle works by the 10-metre gap is the same. So there's a lot of similarities as well. It's, it's been unbelievably interesting and, and very, 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 very fortunate to be a part of it, to be honest. What do you think is easier for a league player? Sorry, hi, Mike. How's it going? Um, what do you reckon it's easier for the union player to go to league or league to union? Oh, I don't think one's easier than the other. I, I, obviously, union has 
the only te- the real technical things around perhaps line outs. Yeah, the set piece, yeah. Loose, used to, and, and definitely the front row part of the game. Mm. But I think it comes down to like a player's understanding of both codes and more importantly, probably desire to to make the change. And well, it's almost a little bit like learning a new language. If you want, if you really want to do it, you'll you'll do the bits and pieces. You'll be prepared to go out on a limb and make the make the errors that you need to embarrass yourself sometimes, trying to ask for a, a meal or a beer or something in a pub or ask a girl out or something like that. You'll make those errors and in the transition between the game, you've got to be prepared to make some mistakes to learn. Uh, what you do. I think probably one of the greatest case in point was Sam Burgess, you know, where I feel like they wrecked the poor fella's head, you know what I mean? Because they had him playing one position in one team, yeah. another position in another team. That guy could have been an absolute weapon, right? It yeah. just, what a footballer. And and the biggest thing about Sam, I know him, you know, from back in the day, when particularly when he was, you know, talking about crossing back over, was that he wanted it. He wanted to make the move. He was eager to learn and make the move. And I found the same with guys like Marika, um, Corabetti, and uh, uh, and obviously Israel when he first came over. What would you have done with Sam Burgess yourself? Oh, back rower. Yeah. Just don't worry about this stuff, mate. Just go and run hard and tackle hard. You know what I mean? When there's a rucket, that's what he's really good at. And he... And enjoy, but instead of the, the nuances of the backs, like just nice blindside back row, have a rest here, mate. And then when you get the ball, you just charge in there and do what you do, you know, play footy. All right, guys, we've got one for uh, for all three of you. A couple of weeks ago, Sam Tomkins said that Owen Farrell would be the best league player in the world. So it sort of got us thinking at Rugby Pass, if you could pick a player each who's only played union, never played league, but could be world-class, who, who would you pick? Mm. Oh, wow. I can think of a few straight oh. away. Who's the first one? Marcus Kramer. Go pretty well in there somewhere. Like, that guy knows how to run, tackle hard. You know, Samu Karevi, he's got sideways movement as well. So he's got good lateral movements, which you need. You need to have that. There's a lot of reading off in league, you know, because of the way they defend. So you've got to have good sideways movement. Yeah. And he's got great ball carry, footwork and an offload. Uh, but Matera wouldn't go too bad in that game either, just quietly. You know, I think he, you know, and there's a few halfbacks who'd probably be sneaky around the dummy half as well. You know, I think crossing over, if I, if I, if I think about it like that. But there's, there's, uh, there's plenty of players. Like Courtney Laws, I think, could do it. Like he's a bigger body, he's a tall body, but he could be quite awkward. I reckon he's got a great work ethic. There's a, I think there's a lot of good players out there that could make. I think the switch, it's just like I said, if you're a talented player and you're open to the idea of making the move and changing course, yeah, you'd be good at. It. Max, what's your what's your uh, rugby league? Oh, I reckon I'd have like mine would be like rolling subs. The big boys just get them on and off. Um, Probably like I think Manu Tuilangi would go very well. I also think uh, Ellis Gendry would be a good prop forward as well. I think he could get he gets for quite a lot of carries in the Union game. I think he'd go quite well there. Um, those would be just on the off the top of my head right now, but I think they they'd get through some good good work there. Switch to rugby union now and and talk about your Puma side destroying Australia back in August, being such a proud Aussie. That emotionally, how did you actually find that whole experience? Yeah, look, I, I had um, I had a couple of experiences sitting in the box, uh, opposite when I was helping out Mario with the team prior. I suppose being in charge, yeah, I didn't really think too much of it. The the second game, I suppose, when it went well for us, and I was you know cheering a bit towards the end, I felt a little bit conflicted and the fact that like should I actually be cheering here or like how do you feel? You you just like in it not too long, you know, I wasn't too long there, but. Yeah, obviously, you you try and you obviously you obviously try and keep all of that, you know, channeled in a certain way. And, and my focus is around Argentina, my team, and they're my fellas now. And I want to make sure that I do everything right by them. And you know, any other game that the Aussies are playing, yeah, I hope they do very well. A couple of months ago, you engineered a phenomenal win over the All Blacks in New Zealand, first time. In, in Argentinian history ever to have done that. Does that go down as your greatest ever individual result in rugby? 
oh yeah no i'm not into all of that sort of ranking stuff <laughs> you know i feel like the best is still hopefully to come you know what i mean that's the that's the thing i think when you retire you're sitting back with a cigarette and a nice single malt somewhere a cigar sorry and a single malt not a cigarette sorry dude. right <laughs> yeah and i'm only having the one i promise you i don't smoke a cigar <laughs> a malt somewhere and, uh, you know kick back looking at you can might be able to start ranking stuff there but i've been i've been really lucky to be um part of some really really great teams and great days rugby days as a whole like the event as a whole and uh but that in, that's obviously up there with them, yeah, for sure. All right, I'm, I'm going to drop the boys in it a little bit now. Uh, both right. Max and Ryan uh, conspired that the players <clears throat> were on a bender for a week afterwards, uh, hence the following uh, week's result not being as good. Any truth in that whatsoever, Michael? What was that? Sorry? <laughs> but our folks were on a bender. Because obviously after that phenomenal historic win over the All Blacks in New Zealand, our boys conspired that the players were perhaps had a bit of fun uh, for the week afterwards. I believe, uh, I can't remember if it was Ryan or Max called it, called it a long bender. Hence the following week's result not being as good. No, no the, following, the following week's result wasn't as good because we were off. We were probably still patting ourselves on the back a little bit and they were on, right? And the margins are fine in this game, you know, that it can get away from you very, very quickly, you know, that all that stuff. So especially against a team like New Zealand, you know, and then when things don't go your way, things don't go your way across the board, you end up with that result, you know, not not ideal, you know. At but for us, have won a heap of games in rugby championships. So learning how to be a winner is is a work on. You know, learn how to be a winner and then repeat winning and try to string two together, try to string three together because that's what you got to do and, and learn how to be able to be comfortable to giant kill, you know, and then keep it level and get on to the next thing. I thought the two games against South Africa for us were really good. You know, I felt the first one we let ourselves down a little bit. Like across both of them, we struggled with our, with the penalty counts, obviously, but... We were right in both of those games. We, we, the, the one in Argentina, well, we really should have taken. Same with the first test against Australia, to be honest, in Argentina. But that's just a little bit of lack of us still knowing how to win, like being comfortable with winning, feeling that we're good enough to go there and um, and do the things that are necessary to close out games or to take games when they're there for the for the offing, you know. And then thought we fought very, very hard in South Africa against all the odds there. It was, it was that we got nothing that day. Um, as the day in, uh, in, in Buenos Aires, to be honest, but I thought we, we had two really good showings there. You don't have to tell me which one's more passionate, but could, I mean, I know what the Aussies are like, and they are passionate people, but the RGs are something else. Aren't they? They, I mean, when it comes to their rugby and the way they are as people, they're such passionate men, eh? I, I can imagine the change room after that one was pretty special. Yeah, they're very they're different guys, you know. They're very they're Latin, obviously. You know, there's a there's a big difference growing up in a Latin atmosphere and a, as opposed to an Anglo-Saxon style, you know, lifestyle that you brought up with in Australia. Different th there's different things that are important to people culturally, and I think that's one thing I've learned coaching around the world that taking into consideration the cultural um, upbringing of people, the people that you're coaching and trying to sort of fit in with that and understand what's important. Even with language, you know, there's there's some words that we use in English that just don't translate at all in uh, uh, in different languages. And and therefore the concepts of those things aren't, aren't really there. They're there in a different sort of way, in a different consideration. So you've got to really try to get on, get a handle on all that thing. But you've got to love these those fellas. They... they are just they love playing out for Argentina so much. It's it's got a bit of that amateur spirit around it, but with a professional approach or a more professional approach as we go. But there's still a bit of that about it, and they're still very passionate about their club teams back in Argentina. They're always arguing about you know who's the best team, and my team beat yours on the weekend. And you know I they when they come when we go back to Argentina, they all go out and watch club footy. Um, whenever possible, we always try to make time if we're in a camp or something so the players can go back out to their clubs. 
watch Club Footy and they're, they're always arguing about it. And I really, I really like that about what they bring because that part of rugby is still really important to them. The participation, the clubs, the juniors, I, I really like that about them and, and obviously their passion for the country. Did it slightly worry you when you saw them with their cups of mate? Because when I first saw it, I definitely thought it was a bong. <laughs> and these strange herbs going in it. I was just waiting for the lighter to come out. And I was thinking, what's going on? Mate, I will, I will say this, right? That I can't remember which hotel we were in. Possibly, uh, I don't know if it was one in New Zealand or when, just on the recent tour. We got a note left for the manager saying, please tell the players that you are not allowed to smoke in the rooms, right? Well, it's obviously the mate thing with all the tea in it, right? So the, obviously the ladies, thought, the cleaners have thought that that's exactly what's happening, right? <laughs> Pablo Matera seems to be one of the most competitive and, and frankly terrifying players in the world. What, what's he actually like? Yeah, he's competitive and terrifying on most occasions. Yeah. Man, he's, he's a lovely fella, like pretty intense. I get on get on really well with him, you know, and quality player. Understands he's still got a heap of improvement in him. You know, I think he, he knows that because he made the decision to go to a place like Crusaders for his rugby education, you know. So he learns a lot there, no doubt about it. He's a quality person. He's learned a lot about. You know, he's had some troubles over his time. And I think that the classic story of rugby that rugby's helped make you know, being in a team and learning the, the qualities that come around being in a team with rugby, like in most sports there, but not just saying rugby, but being in a team sport where you've got to have um, make good decisions around how, how you perform in games and how you perform off the field. And I think that's improved him as a human, as a person. And uh, he's growing. I still think he's got a heap of improvement left in his footy. And he, you know, when, he, when he's on, he's... He's, he's a superb player and he's very talismanic, a leader by actions, really. And um, yeah, I like I like hanging around with him. He's a good fella. 2019, you stood down as Aussie coach. You'd lost your relationship with the board and they were being a nightmare to work with, apparently. Just how dark and messy did things get between you and the suits? Uh, oh, just, yeah, mate, I, I sort of let myself down there because even though there was that going on, you can't, you got to not get distracted, you know, not get distracted with that. Even though I, I suppose I was wanting the game to go better as a whole, as well as the team. And, you know, I come from that background and yeah, I had a collision with some of the personalities that were mainly the yeah, CEO and the chairman, I suppose, you know, uh, try to early on because I know how important alignment is, you know, between the chairman and the CEO, the coach, the captain, if you can, deliver that alignment then you'll use a good chance your team's going to be successful and I know how important it was and I tried early on to do that but I just needed to try harder I suppose <laughs> you know because you can't <clears throat> even if you feel like it's going against you you've got to you've got to make sure that you try and make it work no matter what you yeah know? but how do you do that without compromising your own integrity like well, your own principles yeah. That's it. Well, I did compromise my own principles, right? By when they made the changes, like when they brought in Scott Johnson and all that, I didn't want that, right? Yeah. And I should have, I should have, my, my, the way I am and my principles said, I should have said, no, this is not going to happen. Then if they decided to fire me, then it'd I be could, fine. I, yeah. I, could, I could live with that. But I thought, no, I can get around them, manage that. And, and, no, because yeah. I really try to, to win, you know, get the team to win the World Cup. You know, we got so close in 15 and, you know, I felt like that. The only thing was <clears throat> going on there to improve the team, to to take, go take them one better. That's obviously the, the goal of the, um, as a, 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 once you've been in the final, like really the only place to go is win. win it, yeah. I had a block, so <clears throat> uh, uh, I thought I could get around that, but you actually can't, you know. And I know that from before, but that's what happens when you get distracted. Let's go to a nice quote, uh, Chex. Brian O'Driscoll, uh, Brian O'Driscoll said, uh, what amazed me was after five years as coach, his team talks never became repetitive. 
uh, when you were Wallabies coach, you delivered one of the most animated uh, halftime uh, team talks ever captured on camera, resulting in that huge, I think it was the biggest turnaround in championship history, inspiring that victory against the Pumas, ironically, uh, having been 31-7 down. I know you don't do ranking yet until you're retired, but does it go down as one of your best ever team talks? Um, well, it was, it, it didn't look it, right? but it was thought out. I had a good long think about it beforehand. Yeah, I took my time getting down there, thinking, okay, what am I going to do here? I sort of knew what I needed to do. I had a couple of plans, depending on how the reaction in the room was, like which way do you go? You start off with something, and then you decide, do I take option A or option B based on the reaction in the room? And then I checked the reaction in the room and took the option that I thought was necessary at the time, you know? When you say the reaction in the room, what, the way the boys were angry, pissed off or down, so heads down? I would have, yeah, without giving away too much, I would have been, I would have entered a situation like that with, you know, not with, by saying something, not to provoke, but to get some type of response. If I got that response, the conversation would go one way. And if I didn't get the response I was looking for, the conversation would go another. Because there's a... People, you're in a situation like that down at half time. There's a lot of head noise going on, you know. So you got to sometimes, in in the players, more than anyone, they're out there doing it. So I've got to have a really clear plan as to how I'm going to behave there to try to make a difference. And really on game day, it's one of the few times you can, as a coach, make a difference. You know, you have changes and, uh, and half time, you know, like the whole messages thing, you know. I never listened to any messages when I was playing, so <laughs> try not to give it. Most of the coaches are given it just to make themselves feel better, I suppose, you know, because you've all played. Do you ever listen to the coach's message on the field when you're playing? Because you're trying to get it more often than not. <laughs> they listen to the pod, so yes, boys, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Depends, Franco, yeah. Frank, Franco Smiths don't make much sense at the moment. But... <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Michael, the coach. Speaking of uh, other coaches, you come up against your old teammate, friend, and foe in Eddie Jones in a couple of weeks at Twickenham. Uh, first up, are you both uh, still friends? Do you still chat a lot? Mate, he was up here the other day. We, we said I, he'd come up. He was going to come train him, but he had to go. So he was a mad rugby league guy, right? So he'd come up and I brought my coaches over to have a sit down coffee with him. We talked footy for an hour or two. Yeah, it was, it was good. You know, he says he's an interesting fella all the time. Yeah, of course. You know, I mean, we'll have a lot. Like, it was funny because he was, I talked to him about, uh, yeah, he was coming on the next day on the Saturday. I went to watch London Irish in the sale. And because uh, we have a few Argies playing there in um, London Irish. And I looked over and he was just over the over the, cor- the corridor. So he had a cup of tea, uh, <laughs> half time, whatever. And then he had to go out and do his thing. But, uh, no, we'll definitely catch up if there's time, for sure. You both obviously played together at Wan- uh, Ranwick when growing up. What, what are your memories of, of what Eddie was like as a player? Because there's a rumour that he might have been the greatest on-field sledger there ever was. Look, again, I'm not a rankings man, but he was right up there, I'll tell you now. <laughs> and not only would he sledge the opposition, he'd sledge his own fellas, which is even... <laughs> You know what I mean? And I, I can't lie. I reckon I learned a trick or two. I came into the team younger, obviously, than him. I think I would have learned a trick or two about sledging off him just quietly as far as footy's concerned. But he was a good felt. He was a good guy to play with. You know, he's a type of guy you wanted to play your footy with because he gave everything. He had a small frame, but he, he really gave everything. And you know what? He's not too dissimilar as a, as a player as he is as a coach. You know, he's very driven. Um, very intense, very focused, uh, not scared to, to pick a fight if he needs to, you know, and uh, believes in who he is and what he stands for. And I think his record stands for that. You know what I mean? Like he's coached England for nearly eight years now. Well, that doesn't happen very often, does it? You guys know better than me. And yeah. with a test too. So, survivor. Has he been complimenting your Puma side lately? Uh, well, if he has, I haven't been listening just quietly. So that's, uh, <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt he would be keeping his powder dry when it comes to all that stuff. We'll see game week. There was obviously a bit, some fun and games, but we'll see what happens. It's a bit different, you know. It's a little, it, 
there's it's different, you know, when you're it's Australia, or England, or Argentina, or England. I suppose it's a different, it's a different battle, different type of contest. We heard from a lot of our guests on here about Eddie's like alternative coaching methods, somewhat crazy motivational tactics. We've all, we've also heard uh, that you've got some wonderful tactics of your own. Uh, we had Drew Mitchell and Nick White told us uh, one Bledisloe Cup week where at 7 a.m. The players came in for a meeting pre-training and you were pouring a certain tipple into plastic cups for everyone. Can you tell us uh, what your recollections of that were? I have no recollections of anything like that whatsoever. Right? No, no, no. Look, I, I think that um, it's important to, to keep some variety for the lads and also to give them the opportunity to envisage what thing, to have some vision of what things might look like before they happen, you know, whether it's serious or, uh, you know, a bit of fun, you know. And I think as a leader, it's, I think they like to have a little bit of a, like, they like to have someone who's got a bit of a sparkle in their eye. They, you don't know when this this chap's going to go go off on a tangent or it's going to do something different. I think that's, I like following people like that, you know, who have got that in them, yet can still bring you the stability and the certainty and the planning and, and all of that at the same time. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I like doing different things. You know, you've got to check what works and what doesn't as well. Like you drop and drop a lot of anchors. Like I would plan out a lot of the stuff I might do over a season or a campaign or whatever. And you drop a few anchors down there, you see what takes. If it takes with the players, you move on with it. If it doesn't, sometimes uh, you, you just let it go. You know, you can't, you can't carry it on. You see what what works, whether it's motivational, whether it's um, from, an, you know, just getting the energy going in the in the room because energy is a really important thing. You've got to harness it. Um, and uh, you can it, once you start it going, it sort of catches fire. So if you can, different situations, you can get it going and, and, and it, then it can work a bit of magic. But yeah, I like doing things a little different on the odd occasion. More like trusting your gut. Uh, <laughs> Okay, uh, what Ryan's just brought up, Michael, I'll give you a bit more background. We had, obviously, we said we had Drew Mitchell, we had Will Skelton also, and they both told us uh, they were dropped on a hunch by you back in the day, with Will taking it pretty well. Uh, he actually said, you can't argue with a hunch, that's what he told us. Uh, Drew, not so much, ending up with him screaming at you, <laughs> jabbing his finger in your chest in the car park. What, what, what are your memories of that? Mate, I don't well, know. I'm I think Drew may be like, it's like those surfers who start off getting a two foot wave and after a few beers, it's like a 30 footer. You know what I mean? And <laughs> I'm not sure if he's ever put his finger in my chest. I can tell you right now. But are you talking about when we're on the World Cup? Yeah, well, he said something about a boat trip where he told him he was fat or something. Well, there, there's, yeah, the boat trip was a separate thing, I think. But when we went to the States, yeah, that was made it just like, Sometimes you got to make the call. You know, they say trusting you. I think sometimes you, with the players, you've got to be honest. Like you can't make up something if it's not there. So you've got a feeling. Now, feeling or a hunch comes only because as a coach or as a business person or whatever, you've seen it a thousand or a million times over, right? So you know, you get the feeling, you know how it's going to mix out or how it's going to play out. That's a hunch. It's not a guess, right? It just comes from watching it and watching it and watching it and watching it. It's like when you watch footy, you go, yeah, they're gone here. You know, that's going to happen or, or something's on here. You know if it's going to happen beforehand because you've seen the movements lots of times. So it's not actually a guess. It's like I've got – and, and if I've got a feeling, I'll tell folks. I, I just have a feeling about it. And they've got to trust that that's off the back of my experience. I won't say that all the time, you know. Like, but uh, on – on that, I just that wasn't a feeling. That was just the two lads need to get fitter. That's not a feeling. That's a fact. And they both killed it in that. Well, Drew Drew ended up playing fantastic in that World Cup for us. Willie unfortunately got injured um, early on, but he's he's some player. Like I'm really happy that Australia picked him. As long as they when they, when they play Argentina, he doesn't play. That'd be good uh, because he's a, he's a fine player. The uh, wonderful Ollie Phillips, you might remember, also told us a brilliant story about how you love to get involved in training uh, to up uh, the output. And I think it was a Heineken Cup quarterfinal week. You decided the live session was not live enough. Uh, so you got involved, quickly regretted it when uh, Pascal Pepe uh, dislocated <laughs> your shoulder. Uh, uh, did, how did that one go down? I, 
Well, Ollie Phillips doesn't know too much about live sessions, right? Because he never got in any. He was hanging out in the wind having a rest, right? Or most of the time, avoiding contact. So uh no, I think it um I think that uh when I was younger, when I went to Leinster and I was still like I was only mid thirties, mid to late thirties, you know, I could jump in and get involved in everything, you know. And I think sometimes there's no better way to to show not I, I'm not talking about technical here, right? Because um it's not technical, uh, it's more emotional or mental, like how to how to be tough, how to be hard, how to dish it out, how to take it. You know, that, that that's something you could sh- you show. Like, they'd always hate me. I remember a lens that could, like, give me a grief because they, I'd take them down running around uh, Kalini, like the hills down there in, in south of Dublin. And we had a nasty little running track and they'd do about six or seven and then I'd start jumping in on the hill runs and just start running in behind. So come on, letting a 40-year-old bloke catch up, keep up with you, what's wrong with you? So you've only done one, we've done 10. Like what's wrong with you? It's the coach's option you've got there, you know. But I think getting in and having a, if if you're up for it, not every coach is like that, but I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Now, as long as you're prepared as the coach, that whenever, like if you get sorted out in a session, that's your fault, you know what I mean? You're in there. They're not going to take it easy. Though. Five brilliant year, years at uh, Leinster, leading them to domestic and European successes, including that incredible 2009 Heineken Cup victory against Leicester. Take us through your memories to on and off the pitch of that magical day. Oh, yeah, I think that the, that season was a great season for us. Like, we built up really nicely over the years. And um, we sort of added to our squad every year our we started changing, I suppose, culturally. And it culminated in that year. And it was interesting because in that, um, in our group, I remember going down to the south of France to play my old club, Gast, where the club where I played first when I went to Europe. And it was a rainy, drizzly night and we got dusted, you know, and we weren't very good. And basically, and this is rugby in a nutshell right these days, they say, nah, check it, get rid of him, he's hopeless, get lost. You know, all that carried on and three months, four months later, you're European champions, you know, and that's where well, they're the times you got, they're the times you got to ride out. They're the times where you still got to believe in yourself. You've got to make sure that there's a lot of outside noise, but what you're doing is the right thing. It may not work all the time. You've got to, you've got to stay with it. You can't be stubborn. You've got to assess where you're not getting things right and make changes. And we're able to, to, to hold through that period nicely. And we just got on a bit of a roll and momentum's an unbelievable thing in footy when you can harness it. It works. We won the Europe, the domestic league the year before or that Magnus league as they had it at the time. And, and I think we set that, the, the platform was set up for a long-term success. The next year we made semis in both, I think. Um, and then you can see the change because good decisions are made, you know. The right people were brought in at the right times. Um, not a whole lot of ego about it. Everyone wanted to get to turn the club into, you know, something better. And you can see where they're still traveling at the moment. But those, I think for Leinster, for me, predominantly was they gave me a chance when they had no right to really. I was, when I got that position there, I was like, compared to the other candidates, they took a big risk on me and I wanted to make sure I paid them back at all costs. Is there academy in schoolboy rugby as strong as it is now? Like they've got produced so many unbelievable players through their academy and stuff. Was it that strong back then? No, no, no. Well, that was all just started, you know, all of that. And and I think, you know, one of the the interesting, because Leinster was always considered a Dublin team. So when you, uh, once we reached out, I think Sean O'Brien was probably the player that, that really took us there. He got us into the, he was a player came from one of the one of the uh, the provincial areas outside of Dublin, the inside of Leinster, and his success sort of showed a whole lot of people that are playing rugby out there that you know on those border towns of Munster and everything. This was the team to support, and a lot more players come in. And then, of course, you know, great work from people running the academies to start to insert um, remote um, training facilities. They did. They got innovative around getting bigger players in, and um, you know the, the types of players that they were looking at recruiting, and and built the system. And at the same time, the professional team was able to to build a great 
I suppose, set of role modelling, you know, on field and off field. And it became a place where everyone wants to play. And, and, and I think that their recruitment has been excellent. Also, their recruitment of foreign players as well over the years. From, from when we were there right through to now, you know, they're still recruiting the right type of, of players um, from overseas and they've got a, a production line coming internally. So it's really good for the future. And, and I know now by coaching with Felipe Contempomi here in Argentina, how the, obviously the quality of the coaching there, you know, Leo Cullen, Stuart Lancaster, um, and they, they've had a lot of guys that have that are, they've brought in around their setup that have created you know high quality coaching, and that really helps the team perform consistently. Yeah. Right, uh, Jax, we know you've uh, you've got to go. So this is our final bit. It's a kind of a quick fiery type thing. Uh, we're calling this Checkers Dice. I don't know if you've seen this before. Uh, pretty simple. We're gonna we roll a dice. You tell us first thoughts, honestly, your thoughts on those players. Um, I, being modern, we're going to do the dice on my phone. Uh, so I'm just going to roll the dice very quickly. And the first number is number one, James Haskell. One of the greats. Entertainment plus and one, uh, belying his fancy look, one of the hardest workers on field that you'll ever coach. He's going to love that. That's awful. Damn it. Uh, okay, the next one is... Okay, we're going number four. Curtly Beal. Yeah, nah. He could be... It, uh, I love Curtly because he's he's thinking about how to score tries all the time. You know what I mean? He's a... And he, he'll give you everything. He's as loyal as they come. You know, he might go a little bit astray on the odd occasion, but he's a lovely, lovable... Uh, fella, and oh, I love coaching him. I love, I really love coaching. Him. Okay, and final one, number six, Matthew Bastaro. Matthew Bastaro, man, I don't know if Bas that Matthew liked me that much when I coached Art Ponce because I tried to make him train harder and do all that stuff and whatever. But no matter what, guy was some player. Like he was, he had. Like he's a big man, had sideways movement. He was he was unstoppable when he had the right when he had the right mindset on. And um, I I'm not sure where he is these days. I hope he's doing well because um, there was a lot of concentration focus on Matthew, and um, he was able to overcome that really through his footy. And I hope he's doing well wherever he is nowadays. Well, I okay. said he's playing number eight for too long this weekend. I think he is. See. Really? Didn't know he was. I thought he went to America. There I thought he was in the US. I thought he was in New York or something. No, he was for a bit. He was, but I think he's back too long. I'm pretty sure he's playing eight this weekend, and Easter's on the bench. Uh, Jack's final, final thing. We call it our quick fire round. It's first, first thing that comes into your head. Didn't I just do that? Uh, that was with the, that's your very own dice. named dice game. You get your own named dice game. This one's just the standard quick fire round that everybody who's on the show does. So oh, you, okay. you're, you're now back to being a mere mortal without his own dice game. Okay, no worries. Then. Best player you've ever coached? Oh, tight. Brian O'Driscoll. Loosest player you've ever coached? Man, uh, all the players I've coached are very, very compliant and uh, lovely <laughs> to have in the team. And that's, that's how I picked them. Oh, bullshit. <laughs> uh, also, it's great. <laughs> uh, best coach you've ever come up against? Ooh, oh, look, I'd have to say, considering the records, Eddie, you know what I mean? It's got a good record against me. Biggest fight you've ever witnessed in training? Hmm. I don't remember too many of them, to be honest. There's been a few. No, nah, nothing that stands out. Nothing. Look, put it this way: nothing that I would have got excited about watching. <laughs> Worst decision you've ever made? Oh, cheapest. Uh, Worst decision I've ever made. Oh, making. You know, you're gonna one day, maybe ten years, you'll finally hear this story. But making team announcements without a piece of paper in front of me. Getting it wrong. 
<laughs> Don't even go there, please. Oh, no. <laughs> You'll never find out. I'll never tell you. Uh, uh, stick, stick it in the book. And finally, I'll give you last week's uh, uh, result of this one, which was Scout Burger. His answer to this was Nick White. Worst enemy in rugby. Now, no enemies in rugby. Uh, there's enemies when you cross the white line. But once the game's over, everyone's playing footy. All right, brilliant. Well, sadly, that is all the time we've got left for this week. Uh, a huge thank you. Uh, to checks for being such good value and thank you to ryan and to max and we'll see you all next week